Good afternoon and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the HubSpot Q3 2022 Earnings Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. At this time, if you wish to ask a question, please press star then one on your telephone keypad. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to hand the conference over to Chuck McGassin, Head of Investor Relations. So, please go ahead, Chuck. Thanks, Operator. Good afternoon and welcome to HubSpot's third quarter 2022 earnings conference call. Today, we'll be discussing the results announced in the press release that was issued after the market closed. With me on the call this afternoon is Yami Rangan, our Chief Executive Officer, Dharmesh Shah, our Co-Founder and CTO, and Kate Buefer, our Chief Financial Officer. Before we start, I'd like to draw your attention to the safe harbor statement included in today's press release. During this call, we'll make statements related to our business that may be considered forward-looking within the meaning of Section 27A of the Securities Exchange Act of 1933 as amended, and Section 21E of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 as amended. All statements other than statements of historical fact are forward-looking statements including those regarding management's expectations of future financial and operational performance and operational expenditures, expected growth, FX movement, and business outlook, including our financial guidance for the fourth fiscal quarter and full year 2022 and 2023. Forward-looking statements reflect our views only as of today and, as except as required by law, we undertake no obligation to update or revise these forward-looking statements. Please refer to the cautionary language in today's press release and our Form 10-Q, which will be filed with the SEC this afternoon for discussion of the risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from expectations. During the course of today's call, we'll refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures as defined by Regulation G. The GAAP financial measure most directly comparable to each non-GAAP financial measure used or discussed, and a reconciliation of the differences between such measures can be found within our third quarter 2022 earnings press release in the Investor Relations section of our website. Now, it's my pleasure to turn over the call to HubSpot's Chief Executive Officer, Yamini Rangan. Yamini? Thank you so much, Chuck, and welcome to everyone joining us on the call today. Q3 was another solid quarter for HubSpot with revenue growing 38% year-over-year in constant currency. We added over 8,000 net new customers in the quarter, growing our customer base to nearly 160,000 globally, representing 24% growth year-over-year. These strong results reflect our focus on innovation and execution. Our connected platform is clearly driving value for customers, especially as they look to increase efficiencies while lowering the total cost of ownership during this period of uncertainty. HubSpot continues to be a mission-critical platform for our customers as they depend on us to stay connected with their customers. On the last call, I spoke about the launch of CMS Free and moving marketing automation down into our starter tier. These plays, combined with our focused go-to-market initiatives, drove strong customer adoption and multi-hub momentum in the quarter. Before I get into some of the trends we're seeing in the business more broadly, I want to reflect on a recent milestone for HubSpot, which was our annual inbound event in September. This year, as you know, we hosted inbound in person in Boston as well as online and had tens of thousands of attendees from all over the world join us. It was truly a week to remember with incredible speakers and fantastic opportunities to connect with our customers, partners, and community. I know many of you attended as well, so thank you again for joining us. I left inbound feeling more energized than ever about HubSpot's future. Through my conversations with customers and partners, it's become even more clear that we are well positioned to drive long-term durable growth. And there are three key reasons for this. First, we have a unique opportunity to help our customers with solving the crisis of disconnection. I spoke at Inbound about the crisis our customers are facing as a result of disconnected systems, disconnected customers, and disconnection from their peers. 
To solve this crisis, our customers need to be able to seamlessly connect their data, connect with their customers, and with each other, all in one place. That's exactly what we've been building at HubSpot with our connected customer platform. We can already see the value customers are getting from being able to connect their entire front office. For example, take Growth Lab Financial, a financial services company. Their growth was limited by disconnected tools and a legacy CRM platform. Without a central platform, their team spent hours manually tracking prospects and didn't have the insights they needed to optimize their growth. They consolidated onto the HubSpot CRM platform with Marketing Hub, Sales Hub, and Service Hub. Growth Lab now uses automation to boost conversions and shorten deal cycles and leverages CRM data to get insights on revenue attribution so they can make more data-driven decisions. Since implementing HubSpot, Growth Lab Financial doubled their revenue and saved a significant amount of time eliminating manual tasks. This is just one great example of how scaling companies can grow better with HubSpot's connected CRM. The second reason we're well positioned is that our market opportunity is large, expanding, and underserved. We operate in massive underserved markets that are forecasted to grow to over 70 billion by 2027. Within this market, we have multiple levers to drive durable long-term growth. Our land and expand motion is working with majority of our customers trying a free product before purchasing and our pathways for expansion have diversified with the breadth and depth we have added in our product. We're also launching into new product categories like payments and commerce which will continue to open up new avenues for future growth at HubSpot. Even in the weeks since inbound, we have a number of new exciting features in private beta, including payment schedules and native invoicing. We're encouraged by the long-term opportunity to help B2B companies transform their buying processes and sell easily online. Finally, our product innovation is cranking. We announced over 80 new product enhancements at Inbound to meet our customers' evolving needs and help them optimize for connection. Two product highlights were our new Campaigns 2.0 tool and Customer Journey Analytics. Both are crafted to give businesses a more unified view of their customers' experience and bring data together for deeper insights. We're thrilled to see the positive feedback from the beta so far. As we look ahead, we are focused on maintaining the space of innovation so we can drive even more value for customers and emerge stronger as the connected platform of choice for the mid-market. I'm energized by the opportunity we have to solve the crisis of disconnection for our customers, serve mega-markets, and continue to drive the pace of product innovation in order to set ourselves apart. Next, I want to talk about the demand environment we see today and reiterate our playbook for managing through it. Last quarter, I talked about the demand trends we were seeing in the business through the end of July, including a lengthening of deal cycles and more decision makers involved in deals. Since then, the macro environment has become incrementally more challenging we see two clear trends in this environment based on our customer and prospect conversations. On one hand, deals are taking longer to close. There are more decision makers involved, more approval layers, and budgets are tighter. We continue to see this across the geographies and segments we serve. On the other hand, HubSpot is emerging as a platform of choice to help customers get through these uncertain times. Our customers need more leads, better conversions, and better customer experience. But they need to do it all with less. Our value proposition of easy to buy, easy to use, and easy to build resonates even more now as customers are looking to consolidate their tech stacks. Despite the softer macro environment, I'm confident in HubSpot's playbook for resilient growth 
through the cycle. Our playbook is based on three core principles that served us well during the pandemic and again through the macro volatility this year. We talked about these principles last quarter, but they're worth repeating. The first is solve for the customer. Even during uncertain times, one thing we're certain of is that solving for the customer is good business. What this means right now is that we're helping customers understand the value of consolidating onto a connected platform and the impact it can have on their total cost of ownership. We're also providing even more functionality at the lower end. We moved high value features like marketing automation down to starter and helping early stage businesses get online with free CRM and CMS. These plays are resonating with our customers and you can see it in our results. Second, we will continue to invest in innovation to emerge stronger. We're being more prudent with our hiring as well as discretionary spend, but remain committed to investing in innovation. In fact, we're so thrilled to see that our product investments resulted in HubSpot being recognized as a leader in the magic quadrant for B2B marketing automation platforms by Gartner this past quarter. Moving forward, we'll continue to invest in innovation and functionality to help scaling companies optimize for customer connection. Lastly, we execute with focus. For us, it is all about controlling the controllables. We're focused on driving expansion through cross-sell and upsell motions, and the percentage of ARR from customers with three plus hubs grew nicely within this quarter. We're executing on our bimodal strategy with strength in both net customer additions at the lower end and momentum among larger customers driving double digit ASRPC growth. And we're continuing to balance growth and profitability through more measured hiring and tighter control of discretionary spend. Heading into the end of the year, I feel energized. We have a clear opportunity ahead to drive value for our customers. Our teams are focused on execution and we have the right playbook in place to drive growth in this uncertain environment. With that, I'll hand it over to Kate. Thanks, Shamini. Let's turn to our Q3 2022 financial results. Third quarter revenue grew 38% year over year in constant currency and 31% on an as reported basis. Q3 subscription revenue grew 32% year over year, while services and other revenue decreased 13% on an as reported basis. Domestic revenue grew 33% year over year in Q3, while international revenue growth was 44% in constant currency and 29% as reported. International revenue represented 46% of total revenue in Q3. We added over 8,000 net new customers in the quarter, bringing our total customer count to nearly 160,000, up 24% year over year. A big driver of the strength this quarter was customers adopting the starter CRM suite as HubSpot continues to emerge as a platform of choice in times of certainty and uncertainty. Average subscription revenue per customer grew 12% year over year in constant currency and 7% on an as reported basis to $11,200. The primary driver of this strength continues to be professional and enterprise customers adopting multiple products. Despite the more challenging macro environment, we maintained a healthy growth retention rate in the high 80s as customers look to HubSpot's platform to drive increased efficiencies. Net revenue retention was 109% in Q3, down quarter over quarter as a result of slower net upgrades, particularly in the mar marketing contact and seat expansion motions. Deferred revenue as of the end of September was $474 million, a 26% increase year over year. Calculated billing for $444 million in Q3, growing 34% year over year in constant currency and 26% as reported. The remainder of my comments will refer to non-GAAP measures. Third quarter gross margin was 82%, up two points year over year. 
Subscription gross margin was 85% in Q3, while services and other gross margin was negative 49%. Third quarter operating margin was 9%, including a one-point margin headwind from the impact of foreign exchange. Net income in the third quarter was $35 million, or 69 cents per fully diluted share. At the end of the third quarter, we had over 7,400 employees, up 35% year over year, and down six points sequentially. We expect our hiring to moderate further in Q4 and to exit the year with headcount growth in the mid to high 20s. As we discussed last quarter, hiring for the remainder of the year will be focused in R&D and revenue generating sales headcount. CapEx, including capitalized software development cost, was $25 million, or 6% of revenue in Q3, and free cash flow in a quarter was $36 million, or 8% of revenue. Finally, our cash and marketable securities totaled $1.4 billion at the end of September. And with that, let's review our guidance for the fourth quarter and full year of 2022. As Yamini described in her remarks, the macro environment has become incrementally more difficult through October. It's taking customers longer to make decisions, causing deal cycles to elongate. There are more people involved in the approval process, and budgets have tightened. Our guidance assumes that these weaker macroeconomic conditions persist through the remainder of the year. For the fourth quarter, total as reported revenue is expected to be in the range of $444 to $446 million, up 20% year over year at the midpoint. We expect foreign exchange to be a nine-point headwind to as-reported revenue growth in the fourth quarter, representing an incremental $4 million headwind relative to our previous forecast. Non-GAAP operating income is expected to be between $47 and $49 million. We expect foreign exchange to be a two-point headwind to operating profit margin in the fourth quarter. Non-GAAP diluted net income per share is expected to be between 82 and 84 cents. This assumes 51.2 million fully diluted shares outstanding. And for the full year of 2022, total as reported revenue is now expected to be in the range of $1.705 to $1.707 billion, up 31% year over year at the midpoint. We expect foreign exchange to be a six point headwind to as reported revenue growth for the full year of 2022. Non-GAAP operating income is now expected to be between $152 and $154 million. We expect foreign exchange to be a one-point headwind to as-reported operating profit margin for the full year of 2022. Non-GAAP diluted net income per share is now expected to be between $2.48 and $2.50. This assumes 51.1 million fully diluted shares outstanding. As you adjust your models, Keep in mind the following. We continue to expect CapEx as a percentage of revenue to be roughly 5% and now expect free cash flow to be about $195 million for the full year of 2022, reflective of the incremental headwind from the strengthening of the U.S. dollar relative to our prior forecast. While it's too early to provide formal guidance for 2023, given the material moves in foreign exchange rates this year, we thought it would be helpful to quantify the impact of foreign exchange on 2023 revenue. At current spot rates, we expect a four-point or $70 million headwind to as-reported revenue growth for the full year of 2023. And with that, I will hand things back over to Yamini for her closing remarks. Thank you so much, Kate. I want to close by emphasizing that HubSpot is operating from a position of strength. We've built a robust, connected customer platform that is meeting the evolving needs of our customers. We have a strong balance sheet and an incredible team and company culture that allows us to attract and retain top talent. We're thrilled for HubSpot to be ranked number one in employee happiness among top-rated large companies by comparably just last month. Our culture and people continue to be a competitive advantage for HubSpot. Looking ahead, we will continue to adapt to the realities of the environment without losing sight of our mission 
to become the number one CRM platform for scaling companies. Thank you so much to our customers, our partners, our employees, and shareholders. With that, operator, let's open up the call for questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question at this time, please press star, then one, on your touch phone keypad. Please could I ask you to limit yourself to one question and one follow-up to allow all investors to speak on today's line. The first question we have comes from Brian Peterson of Raymond James. Your line is now open, Brian. Uh, thanks for taking the question, and, and congrats on the really strong quarter. Uh, so, so maybe taking a step back here, you know, Yamini, we've heard from a number of companies that the macro got incrementally worse uh, over the course of the quarter. It sounds like that was the case for HubSpot as well. Uh, would appreciate any color maybe on what changed and, and how you're thinking about the macro impacting fourth quarter guidance. Yep. Thanks a lot, Brian, for the question. Um, Yes, we're seeing many of the same trends uh, in our customer base that we saw in Q2. It was just a bit more intensified in Q3. We saw the longer deal cycles that we talked about in Q2. We saw more decision makers getting involved in deals and more approvals needed. Uh, typically, we would talk to the VPs of marketing sales for approval. Now we're talking to the CFOs, CEOs, and sometimes even the board. Product evaluations are taking longer as buyers are generally much more risk averse and the budgets are tight now. So look, I think we're seeing um, a lot of things that are very much in line with what you've heard from other companies this quarter. The overall environment is just incrementally more challenging than it was in Q2. Now, having said that, Brian, we continue to win, and our value proposition resonates really well in this environment. Customers want a clear value case, and they want a clear business case for driving efficiency. So we're working with our champions. We're working with our point of contact within customers to be able to articulate the business case, and then uh, we're able to present to the C-suite and board. Our customers want ease of use and ease of implementation, because the combination of those two lead to time to value, and that's what matters in this environment. Now, both of those, ease of use and ease of implementation, they've both historically been core differentiators for HubSpot uh, and continues to be a differentiator now, and it's really important in this environment. And then finally, I'd say that customers are looking to standardize on a platform. They're looking to uh, eliminate point solutions, they're looking to reduce their budgets, and they're looking to us uh, to be able to bring more data and have a single platform. We're now no longer a nice-to-have solution. We're just becoming a must-have mission-critical solution for our customers. So all of those are resonating within our customer base, and you can see that within our results. Now, look, looking forward, um, we don't have a crystal ball, but we expect these conditions to persist in Q4 and possibly even into 2023. Uh, we're navigating through all of these choppy waters from a position of strength and will remain exceptionally focused on executing the playbook that I just walked through. Great. I appreciate the color. Maybe to follow up, I you think with the value of the platform, you know, were there certain products kind of on top of marketing that you saw a particular strength in the quarter, whether that's sales hub or service hub? You know, I'd love to understand maybe where the cross sell was really successful this quarter. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Brian, I think, uh, you know, the combination of marketing and sales is becoming exceptionally more important right now. Um, when I talk to customers, they are expecting much more from their marketing and sales organization. They're expecting more leads, better lead quality, better conversion, better visibility into the pipeline, and they want all of this for less, right? And uh, that means we're definitely seeing the value of having a connected marketing and sales hub solution. Uh, that's, that's what is you know, really key within our customer base, and so, when we talk about multi-hub, most of our multi-hubs have sales hub and marketing hub involved, uh, and we're helping our customers kind of navigate through this environment as well.
Thank you. The next question we have from the phone lines comes from Mark Murphy of JP Morgan Chase. Your line is now open, Mark. Yes, thank you very much. I'll add my congrats on the uh, the execution in a, in a tough environment. Um, so I wanted to ask you, as you're building out these more sophisticated enterprise uh, features, um, which started with custom objects, can you share perhaps how uh, some of the upper thresholds are changing uh, for HubSpot if we think about kind of the upper bands for MRR or even just the seat counts um, for, for Sales Hub? as you gravitate into the enterprise. And I, mostly what I'm wondering is, do those continue to increase um, even despite the the uh, macro that you're encountering? Yeah, Mark, thanks a lot Hi. for your question. Uh, look, from a segmentation strategy, uh, we're very much focused on the two to 2,000 segment. So for us, the upper bounds of the segment continue to be uh, 200 to a 2,000 person employee company. Uh, the only thing is we're winning our fair share within that market. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, over the past couple of years, we have invested going up market with features like custom objects. At inbound, we announced more than 80 new enhancements and features across the entire platform. And a number of these enhancements and features are really driving uh, better UI customization, better data management, advanced permissioning, granular ability for admins to control uh, the environment. So a lot of the features have enabled us to win our fair share going up market. And in this environment, uh, one of the things that we see is customers, as I just talked about, care about better visibility, but they also care about better time to value and cost effective solution. So going back to really the fundamental value proposition of HubSpot, we're easy to use, but we have very powerful features, and that makes us exceptionally uh, competitive in that up market. So we're remaining true to the segmentation and winning our fair share of that market. I understand. Thank you, Yamini. And just as a, as a quick follow-up, um, I was wondering if you or Kate um, could could just clarify, um, you because the, the the I think we're trying to maybe understand somewhere in the results where where we would see um, you know some of the signs of incremental strain. But but just based on what you saw, uh, you know, are you trying to uh, convey that the months of September and October, you know, did in fact feel a bit tougher? Uh, say than July and August in terms of the friction in the selling cycles because I think that's generally what we're what we're hearing yeah. elsewhere. Yes, uh, it should be very clear. You know what we saw in Q3 was just an incrementally more challenging environment than what we saw in Q2, and specifically budgets are tight and every approval is being carefully considered. And because of that, the approval processes are longer. Customers are spending a little bit more time, you know, getting a value phase delivered to their C level for approval and sometimes even going to the board. So we're continuing to see that pressure. Uh, we're also seeing, you know, the need for a crystal clear plan to deliver value, which means more time to understand implementation plans, user adoption plans, more time to understand the training plans and all of this means that there's just a lot more rigor, more demos, and more conversations. So uh, we definitely are seeing incrementally more challenging environment from a macro perspective. Having said that, like we talked about, we've put in some plays from um, you know, being focused on the customer, and those plays uh, continue to work at the bottom end, which is where you see the strength in net ads, and we, our multi-hub uh, value proposition is resonating, um, and so we'll continue to work through this choppy environment. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now have Salad Seminar from Jeffries. Please go ahead when you're ready. Hi. Great. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just echo great work and focused by the whole organization. That's all the hot spotters. Great job. Uh, Yamini, maybe a first one for you. 
I know you, you've talked about the macro getting incrementally worse, longer cycles, more approval. But what you didn't mention is a change in the top of the funnel or maybe inbound interest. So just could you shed some light on are you, are you seeing any changes in terms of the, the customers that are reaching out or coming in through the top of the funnel and just interest levels? Maybe is that even upticked because you had inbound in this quarter? Just maybe help us understand what you're seeing at the top of the funnel versus just in terms of the deal closings or, or the cycles. Uh, Samad, thanks a lot, and I will uh, double down and emphasize, I think, congratulations to the entire company, both in the product and Flywheel and the entire company for executing in a very tough macro environment. Um, look, on the demand side, if you, if you consider a year ago, uh, it was primarily all inbound. So it was a lot of you know, people raising hands and coming to us, uh, mostly qualified, and so it was fairly quick to take that kind of a qualified lead and convert it into a customer win. What we are beginning to see is that that level of inbound has uh, changed, and right now it's a combination of that and our customer success team, our sales organization going to customers and going to prospects and having conversations about HubSpot. So it's a combination of people raising their hands and coming to us, uh, and that part of it has slowed down a little bit, so it's uh, us going back to our install base and having conversations on how we can add more value. So certainly from a demand perspective, we see a pretty uh, big shift from last year and somewhat of a shift from the first half of the year. Having said that, what I'd say is like, there's just a higher bar to action within the uh, pipeline. There's, there's more conversations, more approvals, and more demos that are needed to get to action. And so the way I would characterize it is demand has slowed. Uh, we've compensated it by going out and proactively having conversations to the customer base, and it takes much longer for us to close, uh, and we continue to be very, very focused on executing in this environment. Very helpful. And then maybe, Kay, if I could just ask a, a quick follow-up. Uh, I wanted to make sure, I think you said a four-point FX headwind where things stand today for 2023 revenue. So is that, the, one, did I hear that correctly? And two, is that the level that you had assumed when you gave the, the flat margin guidance at the analyst day, or should we should we rethink that as well? Yeah, thanks for asking. I do think it's a really important point for us to communicate. Um, as you know, uh, foreign exchange has been one of those things that has moved pretty dramatically throughout 2022, but frankly, like even within uh, the back half of Q3. Uh, and so you are right. Uh, given sort of current foreign exchange rates, um, we would have a four-point headwind to 2023 revenue growth, and that's about a $70 million uh, nominal headwind. Um, it, foreign exchange did get harder uh, in the last couple of months. Um, you heard us talk about our Q4 guidance as having an incremental $4 million of headwind relative to the last time we guided. Uh, you should assume that 2023 saw similar trends to that. Okay, thank you so much. And, and, Samad, as far as we did, as far as the 8% margin uh, uh, that we talked about at the analyst day, it did incorporate uh, where rates stand today. Okay, perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Have a great day. Thank you, Sarah. We now have Arjun Bessia of William Blair. Can you feel the head when you're ready, Arjun? Yes, perfect. Um, thank you for, for taking my questions and all of my congrats on the on the quarter. Um, yeah, I mean, understandably, you know, as, as more buyers and more approval levels get involved in the process, it creates um, a, a tougher selling environment. But you did mention that you're getting – you know, a little bit more exposure, uh, higher in the organization to the C-suite, to the board. What, what does this do for HubSpot in, in, you know, your ability to paint yourself as a more strategic partner to make a broader platform sale uh, to maybe buyers that you didn't have access to as much in, in, in prior years? And how equipped do you think the sales team is to, to make that pitch um, to, to those higher level buyers at this point? Yep, really good question. Uh, certainly more C 
CEOs, CFOs, CTOs than we have, uh, you know, dealt with in the past. And it is, it's, you know, while the conversations take longer, uh, they are really good conversations. And uh, the way I characterize it is that when we talk to uh, the C-suite within our customer organizations, there are a few things that matter to them. Uh, first is time to value. They really care about how quickly they're going to get to value and how their teams are going to see the impact. And so part of it is uh, us having a clear articulation of value as well as cost savings to you know, the C-suite. Uh, the second is you know, really talking about the value of a consolidated platform. You know, there, over the past couple of years, a lot of these companies have ended up buying disconnected point solutions, and that's costing them. And so when we have conversations with CEOs and CFOs, we talk about how we can help them uh, with eliminating some of these point solutions and consolidating and seeing the value of a consolidated platform, and that certainly resonates. Now, on the second part of your question, this has meant that we've doubled down on enablement uh, for our sales team, for our customer success teams, as well as the partner organization. We've rolled out TCO playbooks as well as value playbooks so that they can bring these conversations earlier in the sales process. They can proactively talk about how we can help them get to time to value as well as cost savings. And that part of the enablement is something that we're doubling down, and we're doubling down in terms of execution as well. So uh, absolutely see all of those within the pipeline. Okay, perfect. Uh, very helpful. And then the other part, you know, your, your new customer ads actually picked up, and, and, you know, this is something that we're not seeing, I think, with your peers where new customers have seen greater headwinds. I'm curious, as you look at a new customer cohort that's coming in, are you seeing more replacement opportunities even in that starter CRM suite where customers are wanting to rip out existing solutions versus more uh, more of a greenfield opportunity that you, you may have seen in the past? Yeah, thanks for the question. Maybe I'll dive in. Um, you are right. The net ads for the quarter came in a little better than we had even expected. And where we saw the strength was really at that starter tier, particularly in the starter CRM suite. Um, these are not customers that typically are ripping and replacing. These are customers where, you know, HubSpot is the first tool uh, that they are largely using. And there's a couple things that we think really contributed to the strength this quarter. Um, you know, Yamni talked a little bit about them, but you may remember we took a bunch of actions last quarter that were really customer first in nature. Um, that leaned into the value proposition at the starter tier. Uh, one is that we added automation to Marketing Hub Starter. Uh, we launched CMS Free at Inbound, and we continue to experiment on pricing and packaging in that starter tier. And it's really the combination of, of these three actions that we believe drove the increase in net customer additions quarter over quarter. It's not something we solve for, it's an output. Uh, our goal is really to drive the both, both long-term and short-term growth in the business. Uh, but you know, this quarter, the plays that worked really drove customer additions and really focused customer additions at the low end. The one thing that I would just add about that is you know, there's two pieces of the KPI equation. One is the net customer additions, the other is ASRPC. And so when you see really strong quarters like this one in terms of net customer ads, particularly at starter, what you're going to see on the other side is a little less strength in the ASRPC growth. And you know, as a result, what I would encourage you to see in like a Q4 is that ASRPC will likely be more like 10% in constant currency. And one thing I'd like to add just on that starter tier is that obviously it's, it's nice to have the revenue from those uh, 8,000 new customer ads. But the other way it helps is that kind of part of our bimodal strategy, which is as we get more and more customers, um, it kind of helps with our brand and word of mouth, which has been a strong driver of growth for HubSpot historically. Uh, and the second piece is that, you know, we're looking to build a CRM platform that's a de facto standard um, in SMB. 
And the more customers we have, the more attractive the platform is for third-party applications to build on, for solutions partners to, to kind of partner up with our customers. So it's just uh, it's, it's a net positive all around. But that starter tier has uh, been a really strong driver for us. Thank you. The next question comes from Rishi Jalal from RBC. Please go ahead, Rishi. Your line is now open. Oh, wonderful. Thanks so much for, for taking my questions. Uh, uh, nice to see continued execution in spite of the macro. Uh, I want to go back to the commentary about the opportunity to consolidate point solutions. I, I think that makes a, a lot of sense just in, in theory. I was wondering if you could point to any examples of that sort of behavior that you've already seen, and if there are particular areas within the MarTech stack or within CRM uh, that you're already seeing that sort of interest from existing customers. And then I've got a quick follow-up. Yeah, Rishi, um, you know, the elimination of point solutions is a place where customers look to um, as their budgets get you know, super constraints, right? And and again, example in the prepared remarks of uh, one of the one of our customers kind of consolidating. There are a, you know many more like that that we're having conversations. You know, we have a ERP software solution organization in North America. They were using multiple tools for marketing as well as their sales efforts, and all of that was extremely manual siloed. And so they uh, looked to us. And over a period of time, we had multiple conversations and initially started with marketing hub and then extended to marketing and sales and eliminating six tools as we were looking to help them consolidate their go-to-market stack. And so uh, that led to not only just improved marketing efforts, but also reducing their overall spend. So a number of customers, now I'm not saying that these are easy, I'm not saying that these are uh, you know, quick, because that's not happening within this environment. But when we start with either marketing or sales, uh, we do have the opportunity to engage with our customers strategically and talk about their entire uh, stack and how we can help them uh, consolidate their stack. Thank you. We now have Alex Zuckin of Wolf Research. Please go ahead when you're ready. Hey guys, um, so just maybe two numbers questions for me. I, I guess I want to understand, given the commentary uh, on the incremental uh, macro and demand environment, um, which, it, which doesn't seem to be, you know, denting gross retention uh, today, I guess, what, how do we think about your assumptions for gross retention for Q4 uh, and also net revenue retention, that 109? Do we, like, does it kind of go down and then stabilize at, at some notional level? Uh, when we think about Q4 and beyond, and then on the margin side, I guess to the, is it fair to assume you you're reiterating kind of the margin guide you gave uh, for 23 at at the analyst day, and is is that just remind us how you think about that balance of growth and profitability again in the context of the first question? If you do continue to see the macro uh, deterioration, what what are the levers that you have uh, for next year? Yep. Uh, why don't I start and then Yamini, to the extent that you have, uh, you know, comments to add, please don't hesitate to dive in. Um, you're right, Alex. Um, you know, I shared in the prepared remarks uh, data points for both growth and net retention this quarter we remained in the high 80s. Net revenue retention uh, fell to 109, and that was a result of really lower net upgrade motions uh, from that growth retention. You know, we've talked about this. Uh, we talked about it on the last earnings call. We talked again about it at Analyst Day, that we thought we would see pressure on that net revenue retention in the near term, really as a result of the macro environment factors, sort of the difficulty that we're seeing there. And so I would expect that you would see Q4 net revenue retention continue to be pressured for like all the same reasons that we are seeing uh, in Q3. I think the good news in, uh, in all of this is that we have seen the customer dollar retention really stick high in the high 80s, um, you know, into Q3 and, and again into October. Like our customers are staying with HubSpot. Um, they are doing things to 
optimized, like cleaning up contacts and eliminating unused seats. They're, you know, upgrading seats at potentially a lower rate. Um, but we think that it puts us in a really nice position as we start to see the economy turn uh, to really lean into that growth uh, with the recovery. Um, over the long term, we still feel good about 110 plus, um, but to your question in Q4, uh, we think it will continue, net revenue retention will continue to be pressured. And then, um, you know, on your margin question, you know, as it relates to the 2023 margin that we talked about at the analyst day, look, if I just take a step back, I think that about 2023 as having a few things that are really driving uh, the margin profile for the year. Um, the first is, you know, we hired pretty aggressively in 2021. We hired pretty aggressively into the first half of 2022. Um, and we, you know, want to, you know, realize the productivity efficiency from these hires. But when you think about 2023, you're going to see a full year of the cost associated with that hiring. Uh, the second thing that I would say is we have actually pulled back pretty significantly. Uh, and taken a number of, of steps to reduce hiring in the back half of this year and reduce overall discretionary spending in things like T&E uh, and facilities. And we're going to continue to do that as we move into 2023. And then finally, we talked a little bit about um, foreign exchange and the impact on 2023. There is real FX headwind to operating margin. It's about a point in this year, 2022. It's an incremental point in 2023. And so, you know, if I just sort of step back and think about all of those things, you know, we're doing a bunch of, or taking a bunch of actions to be really prudent in our spending, and we're going to continue to do that into 2023. Um, but we, you know, we will retain investment in certain areas like R&D and revenue generating headcount to preserve growth both in the near term and long term. So all that said, you know, we said 8%, we're committed to delivering 8%, um, and we will share uh, very specific guidance with you when we announce our Q4 results. Thank you. As a reminder, if we could ask all questioners to limit yourself to one question moving forward. We have the next question from Gabriella Borges of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead when you're ready. Good afternoon. Thank you. One clarification on the earlier demand comments. Is the rate of change still getting worse in 4Q or is it stable at the new lower demand level? And then for my question, I wanted to ask about the earlier comments on the shift in demand from more of an inbound motion to a HubSpot catalyzed motion. What are the implications for customer acquisition costs longer term? Do you think that this dynamic is more temporary or structural in nature? And I'm looking to understand as well, is it cheaper for HubSpot to sell or to acquire $1 in the installed base or in the new customer land? So a couple of things on that, but appreciate the color. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella. Multiple you. questions there. <laughs> so. I'll, I'll try to uh, answer those, and I'm sure Kate can jump in there as well. Uh, in terms Thank you. of the demand, um, you know, we did see an incrementally more challenging environment from a demand perspective in Q3 than we saw in Q4. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a new level. It's not, you know, getting worse it is an incrementally more challenging demand environment than Q2. And all of the things that we talked about, more conversations, more time to get approval, more demos, all of that adds to the incrementally challenging environment. And when I talked about, um, you know, last year, almost everything that we did was just inbound where we had customers coming in, raising their hands, coming to us, wanting digital transformation. Right now, that is not the kind of tailwind that you can hear from all of the macro commentary at HubSpot and even, you know, other peers within the industry. It's a combination of, uh, you know, some of the inbound demand, the digital trend is continuing, but it is kind of uh, metered by the cyclical macro trends. And so 
partly our teams have to go engage with our customers and identify opportunities for them to save costs or consolidate on a platform or continue on their digital journey. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, cyclical in nature. I think it's based on what is currently happening from a macro environment perspective and, uh, you know, the overall structural need for digital and the belief that our customers have in digital transformation has not changed. Um, Kate, do you want to add uh, anything on the latter part of the tax question? Yeah. Uh, why don't I? Why don't I do that? I, I think, Gabriel, what you know, what I at least tried to communicate during the analyst day is that we have a number of different motions to uh, acquire new customers, and we are continuing to make investments in all of those motions that we think are over. The long time, long term, going to drive real leverage on the sales and marketing side. So, we talked about a number of them at the analyst day. Uh, we're investing in data and systems that are really designed to improve rep efficiency. Um, that helps a lot of this all bound motion that Yamini is talking about. You know, we're continuing to invest in our product led freemium motion. Uh, we've been doing that for, for a number of years, and, and we still think there's a lot of runway there. Uh, and we're investing in nonlinear growth opportunities like commerce, right? And so all of those are long term bets for us that will, ha will take time to impact the PL, but will ultimately drive nice leverage in our go to market. In the more near term, um, we do have a number of plays that are focused on driving increased productivity in the sales organization. Again, Yamini talked about a number of these. Um, we have invested pretty aggressively in sales enablement. We're arming both the uh, sales teams and also our customer success teams with TCO playbooks that really help them engage customers as, in a relevant way at the moment. Um, we're leaning into the partner channel. That's always been a successful channel, and it's even more important when we see sort of upmarket, more complicated, multi-product deals. Um, and we're we're really looking at our own um, marketing organization to drive efficiencies and top of funnel demand investment. So all of those things uh, we believe can translate into uh, higher sales productivity, even in this uh, more difficult environment. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Keith Lees from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead when you're ready, Keith. Excellent. Thank you, guys, and uh, thank you for taking the question. Um, really nice quarter in a uh, environment that um, everyone on our side of the, the, the fence were definitely um, quite worried about, uh, given the macro trends that we're seeing. In, in particular, where we're most worried has been Europe. Um, and so I was wondering, one, if, if we could kind of get your guys' perspective on trends in Europe versus the U.S. Uh, I know you guys talked about Europe a little bit last quarter. Has that um, incremental weakness, has, has that spread into the U.S. more so? Um, because your European numbers were, for, or your international growth was, was strong this quarter on, on a cost of currency basis. Um, and then two, when, when you're talking about these, these macro impacts, it sounds a lot like um, it's new customers coming in the door, but the new customer count was, was good. Um, am I misunderstanding that? Is, is the like, elongation of sales cycles, is that on upsells as well as bringing new customers in the door, or like, wh where did that really rear its head? Thank you. Yep, let me answer the first one, uh, and then maybe Kate can answer the second part. Uh, so international revenue grew 44% in constant currency in Q3. Uh, that's, you know, pretty good in a macro environment like this. As we mentioned before, uh, even starting in Q1 and certainly in Q2, the trends for longer deal cycles started in EMEA. Uh, but, however, what we're seeing now is the macro environment is just broad-based. We're now seeing the trends that start in that kind of across all segments and all geos. So a really not a notable difference in EMEA versus North America uh, for now. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and um, you, you um, 
you cut out a little bit, and I think you were asking whether or not elongated deal cycles were seen across both new customers and uh, existing customers. Uh, the answer exactly. is we are seeing elongated deal cycles everywhere, uh, and so there isn't anything that I would necessarily call out other than uh, what Yamini has already talked about, which is the, the bar to action is just higher across the board. Got it. So when, when, when we see your, your new customer count actually like improving nicely in this quarter despite those elongated deal cycles, is it a difference in kind of the, like, the starter edition and sort of the, um, the experimentation you're doing there um, it, um, enabled better new customer additions at, at the low end, but the, the higher end stuff is where you saw the uh, longer deal cycles? I mean, you are exactly right. The, the investments and experiments we're doing at the low end with our freemium motion and product like growth are the key drivers for our quarter over quarter uptick in new customer additions. Thank you. We now have a question from Brad Seals of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question around uh, Service Hub. You know, it's a big category and, and one where you've made a, a big step forward with the, the new release earlier this year. Uh, just curious, you know, is there a different sales audience here versus, you know, sales and marketing, uh, you know, versus support, uh, particularly as you go up market? Or is it is it that platform sale here where if you're, you're already in sales and marketing, you've got that warm lead. Just curious to get your thoughts on just the adoption curve for, for Service Hub versus sales and marketing uh, at your end of the market. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, I mean, as you noted in um, last quarter, we kind of did a relaunch of Service Hub Pro with a bunch of uh, really pivotal features, including SLAs and mobile help desk and inbound calling. And that, what that's really done is kind of opened the door for um, kind of more sophisticated um, uh, service teams to be able to implement Service Hub. And to kind of get to your question, uh, what, what's happening now with Service Hub is, you know, we kind of ask ourselves, you know, post-launch, are more people buying Service Hub? Um, are they adopting the feature set more readily? Are they happy with the product? And the answer to all those questions is yes. So we're overall kind of happy with where Service Hub is headed. Uh, but right now, you know, we're still seeing a lot of interest in kind of multi-hub deals, um, a lot of cross-sell between marketing and sales. And going to what Yamini spoke of earlier, People just want visibility into the entire you know, marketing and sales pipeline going all the way to customer service and, and success. So um, Service Hub right now is a kind of strong participant in that multi-hub uh, cross-sell opportunity. Um, over the midterm, we think it will become an increasingly, um, increasingly large opportunity for being a kind of front door where people come in um, as a result of Service Hub and then we sell marketing and sales up, uh, you know, to those customers. But right now, uh, very strong on the kind of cross-sell motion and, and multi-hub deals, uh, but we're kind of pleased with the progress. Thank you. We now have Michael Turin of Wells Fargo. Please go ahead when you're ready. Hey there. Um, thanks. Obviously, a lot to talk about. Um, I, I mean, I just wanted to take a step back and the, the two key metrics that we tend to focus on, um, just based on the disclosure, the net new customers and the ASRPC number. Um, with 8,000 net new added and 14% constant currency growth on that, that number in a Q3. I'm not sure we've seen those metrics work as well in balance um, this quarter as, as what we're generally used to seeing. So I can appreciate the commentary around the starter. I think that's useful, but can you just talk more about the interplay? I know you don't necessarily manage the business to these two inputs, but um, the reasons that they're both coming through so well, particularly given a, a tough macro backdrop, I think is just useful for us all to hear a bit more about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I mean, in, in truth, the trend that we're seeing this quarter and the KPIs are a continuation of some of the trends that we've been seeing for a while, particularly on the ASRPC. You know, our strength in install-based selling is very much aligned with the platform value that you are hearing from Yamini um, at that professional and enterprise, and that is what is enabling us to continue to grow uh, ASRPC, uh, even um, with the larger customer ads at the low end. Um, Thank you. 
we now have Ken Wong from Oppenheimer. Please go ahead when you're ready. Ken Wong, could you please Ken, into the line for me to play, please? Um, we have had no response from the line. Ready, so we'll move on to the next question. We now have the next question from Park and Lane of Stiefel. Your line is open. Yeah, hi, thanks for taking the question. Uh, wondering if you could comment on the general health of the partner channel. You know, a lot of your agency partners are small businesses themselves, so wondering if they're seeing any uh, added pressure here. And just overall, what does the performance of the agency partner channel look like relative to your own direct sales efforts and inbound demand? Yeah, Parker, uh, really good question. Um, I think, look, the, no one's immune to the macro headwinds that we are overall seeing. So I think, uh, you know, if we see it, partners will also see it. Now, having said that, we have about 6,000 partners within our overall ecosystem, and they contribute about 40% of our uh, revenue. Over the last couple of years, we have invested pretty heavily in the partners, uh, in terms of enabling the partners, in terms of helping them kind of really transform from being a marketing agency to a full-fledged CRM implementer and being able to take uh, our upmarket customers and drive solid drizzle for our upmarket customers. And I'd say that is working really well. Partner contribution to total rep-driven MRR, uh, both what they're sourcing as well as what they're co-selling with HubSpot, uh, is doing well. It was, uh, you know, pretty high in Q2, and it continued to be pretty high in Q3, and that's a sign that partners are very engaged, and they're moving on the journey with us as we, uh, you know, really provide a platform for scaling companies. Um, so we're, we're happy with how our partners are executing, and they're executing in a tough environment, so huge uh, thanks and shout out to them. Thank you. We now have Sarah Hidlian from Macquarie. Please go ahead when you're ready. Great. Thank you so much for speaking me in. I really appreciate it. Um, maybe I want to ask a little bit more of an esoteric question. Um, when you're in, you're in your meetings and you're speaking with the C-suite, I would be curious to know what you're seeing about their desire to move marketing um, away from some of the, the really predominant social platforms that seem to be stumbling a little bit right now, or perhaps where strength is moving to TikTok, and, and how that's helping drive more conversations around inbound marketing. Uh, hey, Sarah. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. I'm going to maybe get started, and then, uh, you know, uh, Dharmesh, feel free to jump in here as well. In, look, the conversations right now are all around driving efficiency, driving time to value, and getting results, uh, you know, that can impact the outcomes in the near term, right? And as we think about that, omnichannel marketing is really important. When I have conversations with CMOs and CEOs <laughs> within customers, uh, they clearly understand that it cannot be just one channel. And so a lot of it is omnichannel marketing, and this is why – what we announced and launched at Inbound, which our teams worked really hard on, customer journey analytics and campaigns, you know, 2 dot functionality, both of those really meet the needs of where the marketing organization is expected to step up and deliver right now. And that's the uh, kind of conversations that we are having. In general, uh, a lot of marketing spend is around driving direct impact to revenue and pipeline in the short term and away from things like ad spend or event spend or brand spend. That is what we are hearing based on talking to customers. Yeah. One quick thing I would add is that it's, you know, it's a combination of there's these new channels emerging and it has to be omni-channel. Part of HubSpot's differentiated value proposition is that because everything's on one data platform, on, in one database, in one unified experience, we have the data to be able to draw the insights, not just how many people visit the website or how many engage through social, or how many through you know, ads, like who were those customers, what was the revenue associated with that, we can do kind of full circuit reporting, which is uh, really hard to do when you've got kind of these siloed products, and that's one of the appeals of the HubSpot platform. 
Thank you. We have our final question from Siti Panagari from Mizzou. Please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, not sure if this question was asked. Uh, if I look at your Q4 guidance, that looks really conservative. Uh, when I look at historical guide for four Qs, um, usually like 4% sequential versus flat this year. So wondering is this mostly effects or you have some kind of incremental conservatism backed into the guidance considering the macro environment? Yeah, why don't I, um, I'll take that. I think, you know, if you were uh, paying attention on the call, we've definitely spent a lot of time talking about the challenging environment in which we're operating, and that is certainly reflected in the Q4 guidance. Um, in addition, you know, you highlight FX. That is also uh, an incremental headwind for us into Q4. We called out uh, $4 million of incremental headwind um, as a result of foreign exchange movements. Uh, and so it's really both of those things that are contributing to uh, our Q4 guidance. Um, we are assuming that the environment uh, stays about uh, how it is operating today. And, you know, as always, we want to make sure that um, we can um, we're confident in, in our ability to deliver, even if it gets just a little bit worse from here. Thank you. I would now like to hand it back to Yamini for any final remarks. Well, I want to do a big call out to HubSpotters globally. Uh, they are just so focused in executing, so thank you. My heartfelt thanks to all of the employees and also thanks to customers, partners, and investors. Uh, look forward to talking to you next year. Thank you all for joining. This does conclude today's call. Have a lovely day, and you may now disconnect your line.